everyone. My name is Paula Dunn and welcome to the Limited Edition Leadership Show. I am a cognitive and human performance expert and today I'd love to introduce you to Katie and Dave Kobler from Your Choices. Um, welcome Katie and Dave. Thank you. Thanks, Great. Great. Um, Katie and Dave are experts in sex, relationships, pornography uh, for, for teenage kids. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we, we talk about, we say we talk about the taboo topics, the, the tough ones to discuss. <laughs> topics that yeah. nobody else wants to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good, doesn't it? That's something I don't want to talk about either. <laughs> so let's get into it. So what is currently happening um, in teenage girls in relation to their self-image and pornography? Yeah, do you want to start? Yeah, look, um, I think probably one of the challenges that, that girls particularly may face is that when it comes to pornography, it's um, kind of typically been seen as an issue that teenage boys mm -hmm. would deal with, but not an issue for teenage girls. And I think that stereotype can be very damaging and challenging, particularly if a teenage girl finds herself uh, watching pornography or is curious around sex and finds herself looking at that and thinking, is there something wrong with me? I'm a girl, I'm not supposed to look at this stuff. Uh, and so that can be really damaging for her to feel like she can put a hand up for help or feel mm. like she can talk to somebody about that. But research is pretty clear that this is an issue for teenagers in general, mm. uh, not just male and female. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there can be a lot of shame uh, around young people looking at pornography in general, but particularly for girls who find that they're, uh, it's kind of a silent topic. Uh, mm. They don't really want to talk about it too much. Uh, during the, the scenario that we're in right now with lockdown and the COVID uh, situation, mm. uh, we find that, you know, research is telling us that uh, young people are accessing social media at a 40% higher rate. Uh, mm. So they're certainly spending a lot of time online. When it comes to body image, uh, we do find that there's a, a pretty direct correlation with girls struggling with body image issues when they're looking at pornography. But just in general, uh, girls, I mean, and boys, but we're, <laughs> we're talking about girls today. Girls are really struggling when it comes to uh, body image issues. Uh, girls often say to me, you know, I, I look in the mirror and I say these things about my body. I hate myself. I hate mm -hmm. my stomach. You know, they're picking mm -hmm. and pulling apart their body parts. And, uh, you know, these words are so damaging. And mm. I always say uh, to the young people I work with, you know, would you say that to a friend? You know, mm. would you look at a friend and say, you know, I hate your boobs or, you know, your legs are gross or <laughs> whatever? And, of course, the answer is, well, no, I would never say that. That's not acceptable. Uh, you know, but there has become this, with this environment that we're living in where girls feel that it's appropriate and sometimes even it's expected uh, to say these kinds of things to themselves. We find that girls who have positive body image, uh, as in they would say, you know, I really like my body or I'm happy mm -hmm. with my body or they see their body as something uh, to achieve things, to be their body to be used as opposed to to be looked at. Um, and I mean to be used in a positive sense, not mm. to be assumed. But, uh, you, you know, often those girls can be ridiculed and put down. And so we mm. do find that it's not just acceptable, it's often expected that girls would say horrible things about their bodies and so uh, we need a cultural shift mm. uh, but also we need to be helping girls individually and that's where parents can play such a powerful role uh, and teachers as well and, and people like you Paula and people like us uh, who can be talking to young people around you know how to achieve this how do we live in a way that we're positive about our bodies as opposed to beating ourselves up yeah so, yeah. No, it's, it's a really strong and valid point that you make, Katie, because, um, you know, for someone like myself who was born with a birth defect on her face, it's it's not something that I could change overnight and something I had to grow up with and live with. Yeah. And being um, not accepted by my peers um, while I was growing up shames me and made me feel like that I wasn't good enough and that um, I, I didn't fit into the, the, the stereotypical, um, you know, normal girl look and and perception so yeah just because you know and and I and I and this is the book I'm writing at the moment and I'm like putting in there my thoughts about how I was feeling and going well you know even though the bullying had stopped in pro like when I got into yeah. senior years of high school 
those those um, negative beliefs or, that I had um, had imprinted in such a young age, saying that I was ugly, that I was stupid, that I wasn't going to amount to much yeah. in life, it actually started replaying over and over in my head. So it became my own internalized um, mantras, negative, yeah. negative mantras. So I can see how girls, you know, these days are, you know, whether they've been told that directly or indirectly um, through the media, through just comparing themselves with each other. I mean, I remember in um, high school, I had a, a friend of mine who, who was a bit more grown up than me and she'd buy the Dolly magazine and, and be really sort of like, and I'd be like, oh, well, maybe I need to buy a magazine as well. <laughs> so then I'd put away all my Barbies because I used to play with them in, in year seven and I was like, oh, no, no, I'm a big girl now. I go to big school. I shouldn't play with my Barbies. So it was like that um, expectation, I think, yeah. So you move from Barbies to Dolly magazine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And if I really wanted to be naughty, then I'd go for Cosmo and Cleo. <laughs> A very healthy pathway. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I, I guess, like, fortunate for, for me and my generation, it was, um, yeah, we didn't have the internet um, at our fingertips to sort of look at pornography and that sort of thing. But, yeah, it, it would be quite damaging. And I've, I've got nieces and nephews who are millennials and the way my, you know, my nieces dress, they actually look like clones of Kardashians and clones <laughs> clones of you know and I was like going that's amazing they look stunning they look like they've just come out of a magazine yeah. and that's what they look like every day and I'm like yeah. wow yeah so, they do look so grown up and beautiful yeah, yeah they're gorgeous gorgeous yeah. girls but sometimes yeah. I feel like they sexualize themselves in a in a, a way so they can be desired you know and be popular and and it's and it saddens me because there's more to them than just the the physicality yeah um, but the yeah. I think the challenge with that is is that that it, we everything is so sexualized yeah. and and girls have this bombardment of your value is in how you look not who yes. you are um and so you know if, if that's the constant messaging mm. it's nice to hear you know you're more than just ha how you look and, and someone can hear that but when you jump on social media mm. it's telling a completely different story it's saying no I know who gets more likes, more comments, and, and it's about the look more than the personhood, yeah. and that becomes really, really tough. But, and pornography plays into that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one of the really interesting things that, uh, that a lot of research is done to suggest about girls growing up being exposed consistently to pornography is that when it comes to sexual experiences, the discussion with friends or with others about the sexual experiences, I think I looked mm -hmm. good, I think I did a good job, uh, mm -hmm. rather than... I desired it. It was pleasurable for me. I wanted the experience. It's kind of a separation from their humanity in I'm, I'm doing a performance for yeah. someone else, uh, which is which is yeah. really damaging. Yeah, and even it's it's so crazy. Like we've some, come so far in our understanding of female sexuality, but we do find with teenage girls, it's they're not talking about how pleasurable sex was. They're talking about whether the other person, whether they looked good or whether the other person enjoyed it. And it is this kind of performance-based understanding of sex. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it can feel a little bit, you know, 10 steps backwards uh, on when we're talking about sex <laughs> collectively. But for girls individually, these experiences can be incredibly damaging a, to their understanding and experience of sex, but also just their understanding of their own self and the way that they, they see themselves as objects, uh, you know, to be consumed and to be used as opposed to individuals who have value and worth. Um, so, yeah. It's, yeah, it's um, interesting, isn't it? Yeah. I, rem I remember growing up because I went to an a all-girl Catholic private school so I used religion a lot to hide behind my sexuality. So in other words, like instead of being pressured into sex, I'd say, oh, sorry, I'm waiting. I'm hot, waiting till I get married, you know. So, yeah, yeah. so it kind of gave me that sort of scapegoat or escapism to say, well, that's why I'm not putting out. It's not that I'm rigid. I have certain sure. beliefs that I want to, you know, instill. And those that guys that weren't interested, that were only interested in that would just like, take off so it was easy yeah. it was an easy out for me sure. and for them yeah but you know that was kind of like my knee-jerk reaction growing yeah. up that I was the tools i had <laughs> i think what's interesting yeah, yeah. is you um you, you said we uh kind of as a response to it i said oh well i'm using my beliefs or faith or whatever to kind of say yeah i'm gonna wait till marriage and then there's a label 
Uh, and <laughs> you kind of suggested, oh, well, then I'm frigid. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, but, yeah, the truth of it is, is we always really encourage uh, girls and guys, you know, make decisions that are right for you. People will always, uh, you know, these labels don't go away and they're very unfortunate and they're very, uh, you know, damaging. And I always go, are we still calling girls sluts? Are we, is that still happening, you know, based mm. on their sexual choices? Are we still mm. labelling people because of the decisions that they make around sex? And, of course, uh, <laughs> it, it does still happen. Yeah. Uh, but it is really important for girls to be making the decisions that are right for themselves uh, despite the labels, despite what yes. society says, you know, what is it? We always say, what is it that you want? What mm. is it that you believe? What is it that's right for your life? And, and that is, you know, when, when is the right time? Who is the right person? How, where, you know, have conversations, really make decisions as opposed to just responding to circumstances when it comes to, uh, when, when it comes to sex, because we do find, uh, you know, the research tells us that 65% of uh, teenage girls will regret their first sexual decision. Yeah, of course. That research mm. looks at, uh, yeah, you know, it's quite high. a high. Mm. It's really high. And it's, and that is very damaging to mm. their sexuality moving ahead. So it's, um, yeah, it's just so important for girls to be empowered uh, to make the decisions that are right for them. And that'll be different for every single young person, of course. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's quite interesting because I think, I think even from my personal experience, I mean, I was quite late before I gave up my virginity. And, um, you know, it, look, I think... If I was to give it, if I was going to give my virginity up as a teenager, I think that would have, I think that would have damaged me emotionally. Oh. I think I would have been really scarred from that because I don't think I was emotionally equipped to to, to handle that, despite whatever whatever else was going around. So I think one of the things I do with with my girls is that I ensure that um, I, I help them create a, an identity within themselves because again, it's too much of us comparing what's normal out there. You know, what are people doing? And a lot of the time it might be over embellished as well, you know, yeah. to say that I've done this and that. And then it plays with with a with a teenage girl's mind and confidence and, and wondering, you know, am I normal? Am I like everyone else? And that the desire to fit in and be the same. And it's like, well, well what what is normal to you? What is the, you know, what does that look like to you? Yeah. And do you want to to go down that path of like everyone else, or do you want to stand up and be a leader of your of your own life? Yeah, so, that's right. So yeah, no, that's really great. So, what can parents do to um, you know make it more of a safe environment for teenage girls to have these conversations? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that we talk to parents about is uh, it's very easy to shame. Mm. Uh, to bring shame around these topics. And uh, we see that quite a lot. Uh, we see, oh, well, kids will naturally, we're kind of losing a lot of light in I here. Know, just got some <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I might just pop the light. Oh, did you say you could edit this, didn't yes, you? Yes, yes, yeah, yes. I might just pop the lights on because it's literally just. Yeah, different. Uh... <laughs> Is that a bit better? Uh, not, <laughs> not really. Uh, the, mm, maybe the lamp behind you could go in front. You want to do that? I don't know how much light it'll it'll throw. It's so funny, the sun has just gone behind the clouds. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll ask that question again when we're ready. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, we always encourage. Uh, I mean, we've got a model that we use. It's the safer model. Uh, start the conversations early. Uh, answer questions openly and honestly, frame the conversation, educate, empower, equip, and uh, regular conversations. Uh, as far as starting the conversations early, um, that's that can make such a difference. <laughs> and as far as, uh, I mean, you, I think your question was how can parents help to make mm. this a safe environment? You know, starting those questions at a young age, it means that this is something that young people are used to talking about in their home with their parents, with these two people or this one person or whoever. Uh, there, there's this bridge that's been built. Uh, it's a safe space. It's a shame-free environment. And uh, it's just a natural uh, drawing towards their parents where we always talk about this stuff. And so uh, we see huge benefits in starting the conversations when it comes to body image, when it comes to pornography or, or sex or any of the, any of the topics really, 
Uh, there's huge benefits in just talking about it when they're little, mm -hmm. uh, that you get the opportunity to uh, give them the language around these things. Uh, and it's as simple as body parts and sex and all of these kinds of topics. Uh, we as parents get the opportunity to um, establish language and culture around that stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's awesome because um, I grew up with a European family. So for those that are, have European backgrounds, it might not be so uh, uh, welcoming to have these types yeah. of conversations at home. Um, right. Yeah, so, but I found as I grew into an adult, um, my mum and I became really best friends. And, yeah. you know, I, I think, you know, when, when you kind of get over the hurdle of teenage years and your parents kind of feel, can relax a bit more and go, okay, you know, she's then you're on the straight and narrow, you're doing the right thing and, and then it becomes yeah. more of a, um, I guess, it was really great because I, you know, it, not, we had an open door policy, mum and I, um, when I was an adult and we talked about a lot of things and she talked about her experiences about things and, and you know, I was really blessed um, to have her open up to me like that, like as yeah. she did and, and yeah. because it, it made our relationship even closer yeah. and um, that's something... I guess being born differently and um, I guess there was a lot of vulnerabilities that I had to rely on mum growing up as sure. well. So we had that really strong bond yeah. because I was a sickly child. But, sure. you know, at the same time, I think one thing I, I really loved is having that open communication with my mum um, yeah. and it does deepen the relationship a lot. So yeah. if there's any advice to parents out there, I would say is to, yeah, it might be weird the first conversation um, but yeah. once you break that ice, it becomes normal. Like yeah. yeah. I yeah. think even for parents to think, who do you want your daughter to get information from yeah. is the easiest way. And, and it's like, yes, it might feel awkward you having that conversation because it was never had with you. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you speak to a teenager today and you say, you know, if you were a parent, what would you want your child to have as far as understanding and education around this and they they would respond time and time again i would want to start the conversation early i would want my kids to know about this stuff from me mm -hmm. as early as possible because they understand the majority of girls first exposure particularly for girls is that they've heard a sexual term often from a boy in school or on a school bus or something mm -hmm. like that they don't know what it means and they're embarrassed to ask uh, sometimes they may have even asked a parent and got shut down and said, "That's a hot, what, where did you hear that? And they're angry and they're, they're shaming that child. And so then that child goes in and Googles the question yeah. and then they're exposed to pornography. And for so many girls, mm. that's their story of their first exposure to pornography. And yeah. it's not just a naked image. It's often violent and aggressive. And, mm. and, and so you imagine the fear and the confusion that that brings into a young girl Mm. This this is why it's important to talk about and, it early. Yeah, and of course, violent and degrading towards the wom woman uh, yeah. primarily. <laughs> so it is um, it can be a really damaging place. But when you met, you mentioned it can be awkward. Uh, I think that we, what we <laughs> find is that if the conversation is started early, uh, it's not awkward. It's um, if you're you know, and one sort of um, example that I can think of is. You know, there's the encouragement by experts to to name body parts as as they should be named. You know, and it always uh, intrigues me. We've got a we've got two sons and a daughter, and we've always you know she knows her genitalia and yes. what's called what and that kind of thing. Uh, it always you know surprises me when running our seminar and you know I mention the word vagina. There'll be about fifty percent of the room who will giggle and you know, like they, oh, you know, it, it's awkward for yeah. them, you yeah. know. Yeah. And whereas for the other half, they're like, well, you know, they've been exposed to that probably from a very young age, mm. and and that's just one example of the way that starting the conversation early. There's nothing awkward, and we can think that's just you know that doesn't matter. But actually, there was a study that came out of the UK that found that, oh, now I've forgotten. It was, it was alarming. It was like 40% of women uh, struggle or won't go to get a pap smear uh, because they feel shame around mm. their genitalia. And so, you know, you can see that actually having conversations and 
being open about this stuff with kids from a young age, it actually is really important. Mm. Uh, and that's just a body part. But when we're talking about sex, we found with our children, uh, talking about sex and pornography from a young age before ever there's been any, uh, mm. you know, they haven't seen pornography or anything like that. There's no embarrassment about that. It's not awkward. Yeah. Uh, they, they are free to ask questions. You know, we flick through a book and one of our sons will go, oh, can we go back to that page? Because <laughs> you know, they're interested and they're free to be interested. I sort of feel like we get the opportunity to talk to our kids about sex before sex is sexualized, mm -hmm. uh, before it becomes this kind of sexualized um, yeah. topic. And so, yeah, and look, I know there'd be parents watching your uh, watching right now who are, who are like, well, we're past that stage. My kid's 13, 14. Uh, it's going to be awkward. And it might be. And like, and that, that's when your advice steps in, Paula, where you said it might be awkward for the first time, but it, it's worth it. Yeah. Uh, but we do encourage, if you can, start the conversation before it's, it's awkward. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. Look, it, it's been a pleasure talking to both of you today. Um, so if people would like to find out more about what you do and how you can um, help their child uh, navigate the taboo topics, where can they find you? <laughs> yeah, they can just uh, head to our website, which is yourchoices.com.au. That's probably the easiest place to get hold of us. Yeah, we're, both, we're both on Instagram and we have a Your Choices Instagram uh, as well, which we've just started. So, yeah. <laughs> How exciting. <laughs> How exciting. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. Yeah. So thank you so much, Thanks Katie and Dave Kobler, Thanks, from Your Choices. Um, and for those that are watching, don't forget to subscribe, like and share if you like this um, video. And don't forget to be you, have courage, and live life without limits. Great. Thanks, Paula. Thanks, Paula.